we are going to talk about urban cults. And when you get into the urban cults, you get into strange territory. And you get into territory that is, is tricky to discuss for a few reasons. A lot of uh, factors going on. We're going to be looking at specifically the nation of Islam. If you don't think the groups are relevant, I'm glad you're here. Nonetheless, you will still learn something and you will still see how it's relevant to apologetics. As we look at the nation of Islam, let's do a, a good little overview for you. And you, you see real quick here, this is a common, common symbol. And all these mean something, justice, freedom, equality, etc. And let's Let's go over the basics of the NOI, as it's called. Because we're talking about urban apologetics. We're going to be talking about urban cults. you got to know some of the history. The founder of the Nation of Islam is Wallace D. Fard. See the man on the left? That guy right there? It's, well, uh, my, my, yeah, that's the left. Okay. Does that guy, does he look like a black American to you? That guy was not. No one really knows what Fard was. Listen, our founder, Master W.D. Fard Muhammad, wrote in Arabic. Are you sure? According to researcher Paul Guthrie, W.D. Fard wrote in the Urdu style. In Guthrie's presentations, he displays cards with Fard's writing proving it was in the Urdu style, not Arabic. Urdu was the language of India at the time. Some believe this is evidence Fard's origins are in India. No, Master Fard was born in 1877 in the holy city of Mecca. Are you sure? I heard that according to declassified FBI files, Fard was born in New Zealand or possibly Afghanistan. Well, that's not right. I admonish you to visit NOI.org website and read the article, Master W. Fard Muhammad and FBI COINTEL PRO. It proves that there are two different Fards. The article was written by one of our scholars, Wesley Muhammad. No one, it's very uncertain. No one really knows. Other than a salesman who would sell rugs and umbrellas and silks, and to make the item more appealing to his customers in Detroit in the 30s, he would say, this came from the Far East, where our people were kings and queens. And he would attach a story to the item. Well, what happened is people became more interested in the stories and less interested in the items. So he started a new religion. That is a short version of how the Nation of Islam began. July 4th, 1930 in Detroit, Michigan. Usually when you think of Nation of Islam, if you know anything about it, what city do you usually think of? New York, very prominent there. That's where Malcolm X was. But where, what, who said what? Oh, there you know. How do you know that? Because you watch me? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, good answer. You are correct. Let's we'll hear that. How do you know it's Chicago? He says, because he watches me. Okay, 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 go with that. I'm glad there's someone here. No, but that, that is true. But Farrakhan, Louis Farrakhan is headquartered in Chicago. And he has a second house in Phoenix, Arizona, where I'm from. I can go down to Violet and 22nd, and I can see it. It's very nice, very nice. It's like his uh, second place that he has there. The headquarters is in Chicago. That's the name of the main mosque. So if you see a mosque, you may not always be an Orthodox Islam mosque. There are a nation of Islam mosques, and maybe from the outside, you may not know the difference. Now, during this tumultuous time of transition, 64 to 78, that's also when they really blew up. They really started to gain some serious followers in this time, um, especially because of a man named Malcolm X. Now, I haven't talked about this guy in the middle yet, Elijah Muhammad. It's true that Fard started this thing, but he disappeared. No one knows what happened to him. Elijah Muhammad came pretty quickly, and he's really the one who organized it properly. So he's really the kind of main fountainhead, in a sense, of the modern-day nation of Islam. And he wrote a very famous book called uh, Message to Black Man in America. You'll still see people have it. So how can it be an Arabic word? If you don't believe me, you can read about it right here in Message to the Black Man in America by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Did Elijah Muhammad know Arabic? No. Then how would he know if it's an Arabic word? 
And in fact, if you have seen the Malcolm X movie that came out in 92 with Denzel as Malcolm X, you'll see when he goes to prison, because his name is Detroit Red, this is all true stuff. This part of the movie's all right. And he's approached by a, a guy who's part of the Nation of Islam. He says, brother, you don't even know who you are. And that's a very fundamental question because it's a question of identity. A lot of cultic groups answer the question of identity in a satisfactory way for the adherent. That is why us as Christians, a key thing we need to learn to focus on is what it means to have identity in Christ. And so before you say, well, these people are crazy. These are weird. They're just hateful. A lot of cultic groups answer that question of identity in a satisfactory way for the adherents. And so even, even Mormons, you know, do you know that when your temple's sealed, the guy whispers in your ear and tells you what tribe you're from of Israel? Did you know that? It's almost always the Ephraim, by the way. Sorry, spoiler alert, Mormons who don't know. Every now and then it'll be something else, but it's almost always Ephraim. Now, the question of identity is still fundamental with these cultic groups. And so they're growing. And also imagine, while MLK is preaching nonviolence, Malcolm X says, we don't advocate violence, but we do advocate self-defense. And so if someone accosts you, why would you let them do that? Christianity has pacified you into thinking that's the solution, but it's not. When you see injustice after injustice, you got to think of when this religion is forming, that can be very appealing. Plus, you're not just a regular old black person. You're from the lost tribe of Shabazz. And let me tell you about the true meaning of these scriptures that have been hidden. So you hopefully can start to see how some of these groups have an appeal and they also encourage some things that we would see as good, hopefully, regardless of our perspective, such as being entrepreneurial, very foundational. You know, they bought farms, all kinds of stuff. But as some of you may know, a lot of infighting happened. And yes, it was partially their fault. They're sinners trying to have a religion about God. But also the FBI helped. The FBI would send fake letters from one mosque to another saying, did you know what this guy said about you? True things. I'm not a conspiracy theorist. These are true things. The FBI was worried about what they called a black messiah. So they had an interest in seeing these groups fall apart. Now, did they orchestrate Malcolm X assassination? Almost absolutely not. It was done by Muslims who saw Malcolm X as a traitor once he started embracing a more universalistic type of Islam. But did the FBI most likely know about it and not worry about it? Most likely that's the case. It's, uh, you know, true stuff. Now, current leader is Louis Farrakhan. He is older. He's the guy down there on the, on the bottom part. He is older, and there's major questions about what's going to happen next. Most people see the NOI's main milestone as the Million Man March. Y'all remember that? It's probably 400,000 people there in D.C. Uh, so it may not be a million, but first of all, it's a good name. Second of all, that's a lot of people. They did it again. They did it again a second time. A lot of people don't know about that. We'll talk about that. So there's some of the basics of the doctrine and the history. And sometimes some of these ideas creep into churches even. And they are decidedly opposed to Christianity. This is their stuff. The stuff I'm showing you is from their literature and their imagery. On the top it says, in the name of our Savior, Allah. Who is the Savior, Allah, pictured? You guys probably can't see, but do you guys remember the first guy I showed you who started it? Fard. That's Fard. They call him our savior, Allah. So can anyone who knows about Islam, do you think the average Muslim would be cool with this religion? No. Why? What's the problem? Do you at least believe in one God, Allah? Of course. Allah came in the person of Master W.D. Fard Muhammad to Detroit in 1930. What? It is shirk to associate any partners with Allah. Well, that can't be. The plurals in the Quran clearly show that Allah has partners. Haven't you heard 13th century Islamic scholar Ibn Taymiyyah tells us that the plurals are the plurals of majesty. Are you sure? You never said this in the Quran, did you? Peace be upon me. No, no, I did not. No, you did not. And this is why the nation says that Islam teaches the democratization of deity, for the black man is God. You got Allah, forget, you got Allah embodied. 
Yeah, he got it. so 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 clearly Nation of Islam is not very Islam y. It's really not. But nonetheless, that's the name. Which one will survive the War of Armageddon? Farrakhan and Nation of Islam has a whole thing with UFOs, how it relates to Armageddon and the mothership. And a lot of religions do. A lot of religions have that kind of stuff in their eschatology. They certainly do. And so that's what they're talking about here. I don't know about all that, but one reason the mothership is going to rain down judgment on the United Snakes of America during Armageddon is because this country held slaves of African descent. They hated their black slaves then, and most of them still hate us now. Not me. I love my black slaves. Excuse me? Yes. I once had a black slave named Mahrin. He was such a great worker. I had him do more labor than my average slave. You can read all about it in Tabri and Jazia. Of course, I can't read it myself because as everyone knows, I can't read. White devil Christianity, notice where they got the American flag. So there'd be like a, the one-to-one -one association they have with that. And then they have a burning cross that says slavery, suffering, death versus, and in the middle is one of those public lynchings where people like to go see people dead, the new Islam, freedom, justice, equality. If you remember, the flag has F-J-E. Now, look a little bit more at their imagery. This is the rest of it. Our Savior Allah and his new universal order of Islam shall be the victor. The 6,000-year murderous rule of the white man has come to an end. Now, where does that come from? Some of you might know this if you've looked into this because it's one of the stranger doctrines of the nation of Islam. The idea that there is a big-headed scientist named Yakub who wanted to see how f much he could dilute the gene pool of the, of the black man. And he kept on getting these admixtures until he came up with one who had basically little melanin, and that was the white man. So the white man is a product of this big-headed scientist named Yakub. And what happens is because he sort of took all the good stuff out of, uh, of, of these people, the, the, only the bad stuff was left. And so that's why you are who you are, if that's you. Now, you may say, that's crazy. But again, understand this. If you see nonstop justice and injustices, and you got to understand, when was the, I mean, I just showed you a picture of people attending a public lynching. Well, like, imagine that being a town event, and then burning him, and then sending postcards about it. This is all what was done. Imagine that being a town event, right? You want to have sort of a theodicy. What is a theodicy? Sort of an explanation of God's actions is the term, is the definition, especially in relation to the problem of evil. A theodicy is trying to explain the problem of evil in a theistic context. So what helps to explain? You basically say, well, the reason why this is happening is because these people are descended from inferior evil beings. That's why they act how they act. Do you understand there's a certain level of logic even to the insanity? These things aren't randomly out of nowhere. And you may say, well, that's messed up. Well, I think I remember somebody saying that black folks bore the mark of Cain and that they had the curse of Ham on them. And that's why slavery was justified. It sounds like people do this kind of thing to each other, don't they? Make up some origin story to explain their inferiority to justify how they are or the treatment they should have. Do you guys follow it? So I tr I'm doing this to partially get us to be empathetic w all while standing against it and try to understand. Standing on your square is something that means staying on the uh, sort of the right place and they're standing on the square of supreme wisdom, which will become relevant later if we have time to get to it. So let's talk a little bit more about the origin history, actually looking at their beliefs. This is from their doctrinal statements. So I'm letting them speak. I'm not just telling you, right? We believe that. Allah, God, appeared in the person of Master W. Far Muhammad, July 1930, the long-awaited Messiah of the Christians and the Mahdi of the Muslims. We believe firmly and lastly that Allah is God, and besides him, there is no God, and he will bring about a universal government of peace wherein we can all live in peace together. Yes, I read fast because your brain can comprehend it, and it's on the screen. Take a picture. If it's too fast, we'll be okay. Otherwise, you'll get bored. You'll be looking at your Twitter update. Okay, so that's what they believe, and uh, during the 60s was a time where they were very culturally present, and there was a relationship between X and Muhammad Ali. And 
If you want to know a little bit more, I think I have five copies of a magazine called the Christian Research Journal. So it's, it's only five. I'm selling it. And I didn't write the article on Malcolm X, but I wrote an article inside of it. That's why I'm selling it. But it talks a little about Malcolm X and, and uh, the, the ethic or non-ethical use of violence from a Christian perspective, of course. It's an apologetics magazine. But it's an interesting thing on lesser discussed topic. Well, eventually when X discovered Elijah Muhammad's indiscretions, we'll just put it that way, you honor my name. Do you honor my teachings? Oh, yes. So you practice polygamy then? Well, according to Minister Farrakhan, quote, we can talk about having more than one wife because it's written in the Holy Quran, but are we qualified for that? If you cannot handle one wife, how are you gonna handle two wives? Of course, Elijah Muhammad did believe in multiple wives and even fathered 21 children with multiple women. He leaves and does some soul searching. He actually had a transition at the end of his life. Yes, it was better, but then again, it wasn't better because he was going Orthodox Islam. So it's like, pick your poison, right? Well, Muhammad Ali distanced himself uh, from him at that point. But the NOI produces the FOI, and the FOI is the fruit of Islam. So imagine you're in chaotic South Chicago, right? And you see guys in bow ties marching through in unison saying, do better. Do you understand the attraction to that? Now, this essentially has been replaced by the Hebrew Israelites in 2024. That's what tomorrow's session will be about. I'm not repeating my sessions. Yes, it's still urban apologetics, but tomorrow's all about the Hebrew Israelites. They've essentially been replaced. NOI is on the downturn. They're not in the ascendancy. They're sort of a legacy cult, if I could use that term. But the BHI are on the ascendancy. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Teaser. So this is the FOI, and there is... Louis X, that was originally what he went before, before Farrakhan. And there's the book, Message to the Black Man, I mentioned, as well as How to Eat to Live. So a common problem is like, hey, you know, health. And, and so he would write books about very practical things. Uh, uh, Muhammad, Elijah Muhammad, he, uh, this is Louis Farrakhan, a younger Farrakhan, promoting his books. Continuing on, uh, I talked about the Million Man March, and there was a follow-up in 2015 called Justice or Else. And interestingly enough, one of the speakers there was Ben Ami. This is where I'm showing you ecumenical elements within certain cults. Ben Ami is a leader of the African Hebrew Israelites of Jerusalem who live in Demona, Israel, and claim to be the real Israelites. Now, Ben Ami is dead, but guess where his group is? emerged from in the 60s, south side of Chicago. And so he spoke at the Million Man March, believe it or not. Interesting. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. Now, relevance, because I said they're a legacy cult, so you may say, well, what's the point of vocab? They're still relevant, though, because of that. Here is Louis Farrakhan meeting. It's on the screen, so if you, if you guys don't know, it's at the top. You can see you, really, you can sound culturally relevant, although Eminem is sort of 20 years past hardcore culture relevance, but that's Eminem. Makes sense. Detroit Connection and Paul Rosenberg. Rosenberg, that's interesting. They're meeting because Farrakhan's not a big fan of certain groups of people that he refers to as leeches and bloodsuckers. There's Russell Simmons and Rick Rubin. Anybody know who they are? Who is it? Tell me. Founders of Def Jam Records. This is hip hop stuff, y'all, but it's still relevant and big because out of that, you have people like Jay-Z come out. So this is, this is relevant. So, you know, there they are with Farrakhan. Let's talk a little bit more about the Nation of Islam and their forays into mainstream culture when they appear in the news. This is an interesting story here. December of 2018, there's a controversy over them receiving federal funds for religious services, acting as spiritual guide services and their study services. They apparently, Nation of Islam Prison Ministry, had received $364,500 in contracts and awards from the U.S. Bureau of Prisons and Department of Justice between fiscal 2008 and 2019. Now, you can see why people might have a problem with that because it's like, well, Farrakhan's really anti-Semitic. And I heard him say white people are devils and, you know, should we be? So they, there's some controversy, but a lot of people are like, hey, if you can get them uh, cleaned up and doing better, okay. So it's sort of, it's like that. So that's one thing. Another is the Women's March. Now, if you remember the Women's March, there's people who went around, went around with cameras and asked them at the Women's March, can you define a woman? And most of them could not define a woman <laughs> at the Women's March. It's a true story. So you would think that's not going to line up with Farrakhan because he's sort of 
in a strange way on the right on a lot of issues, right? They're, they're, they're in a sense of certain moral issues. They're actually with us, so to speak, if you understand what I'm saying. But yet Women's March, not so much, but there's this strange gelling that happens. And so this is one of the co-founders, Tamika Mallory, and she's attended his Savior's Day speech. Now, if you had to guess, Nation of Islam, when would they give the, who would the Savior's Day speech be honoring, if you had to guess? Yeah, who said that? Oh yeah, that's, yes, it's honoring Fard. You got it. So they still, it's still a very big event for them every year that they do. And during it, he said this, Jews were responsible for the filth and degenerate behavior that Hollywood is putting out, turning men into women and women into men. So you could see why people were confused when she said, thank God this man is still alive and doing well. He definitely is the goat. What's the goat stand for? Most of you all know. Isn't it funny that a rapper came up with that? Did you guys know LL Cool J was the first one to say the goat? And now it's common, common conversation, right? February 2019, he drew criticism for that speech because he said other stuff that I'm going to mention. It's, this is a quote from it. You can look this up. The real story is what I try to tell you from the beginning. It didn't happen back there. It's happening right while you're alive looking at it. I represent the Messiah. I represent the Jesus, and I am that Jesus. If I am not, take my life. He also said, can't stop there, right? Once you're heretic, you got a heretic. God does not love this world. God never sent Jesus to die for this world. Jesus died because he was 2,000 years too soon to bring about the end of the civilization of the Jews. He never was on a cross. There was no Calvary for that Jesus. Here I am in front of you. I represent the Jesus that saves. I don't represent somebody that came to judge you and me for our errors and mistakes. Well, this sounds like another gospel, ladies and gentlemen, because it is. And that's really the problem with these groups. Some of you sometimes get caught up in the incidentals. A Jehovah's Witness doesn't want to celebrate a birthday. Eh, okay, let them be. Mormons wear strange garments. Eh, okay, right? Is that real? The fundamentals are these issues. Don't be these outlying apologists talking about people's clothes all the time, you know? Or why don't you celebrate this? No, these are the fundamental issues. Because what does Paul say in Galatians? If anyone brings another gospel, let them be? That's right. In the Greek, it's anathema. Anathema. He's saying even me. So that's the fundamental issue, not these other things. The Nipsey Hussle Memorial... Farrakhan, of course, was there, April 2019. Here's some of the remarks he gave. And he's talking about uh, <clears throat> the Nipsey Hussle's real name here. Aramiah is in the language of Etrian, because he was part of Etrian. People means God is rising. He is a prophetic voice of all the community. He was a brilliant mind, and the Spirit of God was in his life. And if you notice there real quick, I had the picture of the final call. That's the magazine that you can still find in barber shops and on the quarter and things like that. It used to cost a dollar when I was younger. I don't know how much it costs now, but, but I think it's an interesting thing, thing to, to buy because you can kind of see what they're about, at the, especially at the back section. Um, but there's that. And here, this is where it gets really strange. I'm just going to briefly talk about this. <laughs> I know the picture's not that clear, but these are Nation of Islam members who are getting recognized for becoming, yes, being equipped to teach Dianetics. I still haven't got to the bottom of this story because it's almost too strange of how, why are they getting trained? Why are they doing training? The speculation is the Scientologists are trying to do it to seem less weird and less racist or something. And the Nation of Islam is doing it maybe because they're getting some money from them. I do not know. I don't fully understand. I've looked somewhat into it. But look it up. This is from an auditor's day ceremony. You guys know what the auditor is? Hold these two cans. Although I think they've updated how they do it now. But hold this. Oh, look at the e-meter. You've got a lot of stuff on you. We got to get cleared out. You know, from that pre, that battle that happened a long time ago on our planet. And they're attaching to you. Some of you are like, what are you talking about? That's Scientology stuff. Some of you know it because it's interesting. Well, let's talk about their beliefs a little bit more. I'm going to have to rush through this part. But notice what it says, the Holy Day of Atonement there. At the back of every final call was a section that says, what the Muslims believe. And I just want to read some of this to show you how contrary it is to Christianity. Because here's the thing, with some of the urban cults, 
they criticize Christian doctrine, but they, they also criticize Christian practice. And they'll point to things like the Crusades and different things and talk about these. Or, you know, slaveholders in the South, these types of things. But it's not merely that. It's also actually criticizing Christian doctrine as well. We believe in the resurrection of the dead, not in physical resurrection. <laughs> That's called a self-refuting statement. Mm -hmm. We believe in the, but not in the physical one, you know, the non. So this is how these guys go, right? But in mental resurrection, we believe that the so-called Negroes are most in need of mental resurrection. Therefore, they will be resurrected first. Furthermore, we believe we are the people of God's choice, as it has been written, that God would choose the rejected and the despised. We can find no other persons fitting this description in these last days more than the so-called Negroes in America. We believe in the resurrection of the righteous. This is written, you know, uh, mid-20th, early uh, 20th century, so it has a different type of language. And uh, number seven, I'm not going to read through it, but basically it calls for separation. So some of you may have heard when the Nation of Islam met up with members of the Klan to try to figure out how they could partition out America. You know, you guys go over here and you guys over there and don't cross the street. R real thing. Because they have similar interests, right? They both want separation. Separationists in that sense. Don't have time to go through beliefs, but there's other stuff they believe. <laughs> it, get a final call and you'll see it. And they also have what the Muslims want at the back of everyone. Some of the things we would agree with. Some of them we would not agree with. I'll let you look up with that. Well, here's, uh, here's one I do want to read. Number five. We want freedom for all believers of Islam now held in federal prisons. We want freedom for all black men and women now under death sentence in innumerable prisons in the north as well as the south. So how can it be an Arabic word? If you don't believe me, you can read about it right here in Message to the Black Man in America by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Did Elijah Muhammad know Arabic? No. Then how would he know if it's an Arabic word? Other beliefs that are in, again, contradict, that contradict Christian doctrine. We believe in the Holy Quran and in the scriptures of all the prophets of God. We believe in the truth of the Bible, but we believe that it has been tampered with and must be reinterpreted so that mankind will not be snared by the falsehoods that have been added to it. So it's sort of a vague junk drawer of eisegesis, meaning it gives you license to be like, well, not this. Well, yeah, that one, not this, right? And they're not the only group to do that. Anybody know another group that officially says something very similar to this? Islam. Yes, Muslims and Mormons, both. Those are the perfect, perfect answers. Uh, you know, Mormons, insofar as it has been interpreted correctly, that's their line, right? So this is, this is true. This is a common thing that is said. And you know what? On one hand, it's like, hey, that's shady. But on the other hand, I find it helpful. You know why? Because it says, so it's like this. So what you're telling me is your religion doesn't agree with the Bible. You see what I'm saying? Otherwise, you wouldn't have to do this. Imagine you go to a church and you're like, we only accept these 49 books. These other ones, not so sure what you're telling me is, right? Part of the reason I do this, though, is if you're really going to get into these things, you're like, well, I can't remember all this stuff, vocab. What's going on? Even you're using slides. What I want to also just say is, a, is sort of an aside is this. A key element of you doing evangelism, of apologetics, even just of being a basic, decent human being, is asking questions about what people believe. If you get to talk to someone who was influenced by the nation of Islam or a similar situation, don't be like, I went to this session one time. Let me tell you a thing or two. <laughs> Ask the person questions. You still don't know exactly where they land on the spectrum. You still don't know exactly their viewpoint on all of this. You, you want to hear them express it in their own words. Ask them questions. It's so key. I'm not against soliloquies and monologues and sermons and sermonettes, but asking them questions to find out where they're at is very important. You get to learn about what they believe, why they believe it. And you know the best questions to ask, right? Why do you say that? What do you mean by that? Could you please, I didn't under, could you define that? Expound upon that. Tell me more. Where'd you hear that? Where'd you get that from? Are you sure? <laughs> Those kinds of questions. By the way, how long do we have in here? I, 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 uh, oh, is this telling me how much time is left? What is that? Oh, this, oh, it is a clock. Okay, that's cool. I'm learning so many things here today, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so I, I, I'm not going to look at, Everything, what I'm trying to show you is a little bit of what they say. This one's important, I think. 
from Elijah Muhammad. The Bible is now being called the poison book by God himself. Well, I don't remember him saying that. <laughs> I missed the memo. Who can deny that it is not poison? The book can't be recognized as the pure and holy word of God. Now, let's say you had a Bible in your hands, regular old, you know, 66 books type of Bible, and you looked back at the history of certain things and being vague to help you not too much. What are some parts of the Bible you might say, those are problematic, especially for our people? What about slavery? Yeah, is the Bible accepting, pushing what's going on with the slavery question? Obviously, that's a whole other session, but that is, that's one. There are others, but that's one that would jump out. Paul, slaves, obey your masters. What do we do? Stuff like that, yeah. So it is important, again, to understand these things, at least see where people are coming from. Um, continuing on, we believe in the one God whose proper name is Allah. We all know that there was a God in the beginning that created all these things and do know that he does not exist today. What? <laughs> they have a strange thing that's kind of Gnostic-y that I haven't got fully figured out about how things came into existence. It has to do with triple stages of darkness is what they call it. And it gets really, really odd. But uh, they like to make fun of Christians and say, we don't believe in a spook God. So they're, they're, because they're saying their God is embodied all the way down through. They think of God in terms of something without form, spirit, or spook. Imagine that being like a doctrinal statement. And they believe that his throne is somewhere in the sky. Jesus did not consider himself, now we're on to Jesus here, to be God or a son of God or equal of him. Jesus is only man and a prophet of Allah. Now, so for you, instead of just saying, well, they're wrong, think if someone said that to me, how would I try to show what would i say i would probably say what do you mean by that what do you mean he was only a man or something like that right what do you mean he wasn't equal to god and then you should have a few scriptures on deck so think to yourself what are the scriptures that i would use vocab said he's not even going to help me know any but he's telling me i should know a little bit of how to defend the deity of jesus there's a good one john 8 58 in the house thank you very much that's, that's a great one before abraham was ego and me i am that's a great one, especially if you read the full context of that conversation. The book of John is filled. The Gospel of John is filled with stuff like that. And it's not the only place. Colossians 1, 15 through 20, that one's so tough. The Jehovah's Witnesses had to insert the word other right in there to make it seem like he didn't create everything. So, yeah. So these are, these are good things to know because really it's fundamental. You notice false religions don't like the gospel and they don't like God and they don't like Jesus being God. Have you noticed that? <laughs> don't be that guy. Farrakhan, in relationship to Jesus, said, I am hanging on the cross right now. I'm on Calvary right now. And the more I suffer, the more our people are raised to consciousness. So see how it's substitutional, but it's for something else, right? Mental awareness, kind of Gnostic. You don't have to look for Jesus. <laughs> I represent him. It's almost like if you've seen the Father, you've seen me, guy. That's, you know, I was born to die for you, and I love the thought of dying for you. Well, hurry up, guy. Trinity. The Christians refer to God as a mystery and a spirit and divide him into thirds. Is that what we do? We don't do that. When you describe the Trinity, try to stay away from words like parts, manifestations. The best word really is person. Now you got to define person because some people think that means human, but you're not saying three humans. You're saying three persons. Person, sort of short for personality, but it's a little bit more than that. If you want to get a little easty, you could say essences, maybe. But Separation, not a great word. Better word is distinctions. So it's just trying to get stuff precise. Because the Trinity is something that almost every cultic group attacks. One part, I think he should say person, they call the Father, another part the Son, another third part they call the Holy Ghost, which made three, one, contrary to both nature and mathematics. Can't do that, blah, 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 blah. So check it out. He says it's absolutely sinful to make the Son and the Holy Ghost equal with the Father. You see that down there at the bottom? Now, you don't like when someone describes the Trinity as parts because you know it's not accurate. So we should work to represent other groups honestly, even if we don't agree with them. You see, how you, we don't like that when you describe the Trinity incorrectly. We should also not want to describe other groups incorrectly. Part of being a Christian of loving your neighbor, and that includes your Muslim and your nation of Islam, a neighbor, whoever they are. Part of it, I do believe, is working to describe their beliefs accurately. Just a little side nugget there. We're going to have to skip a little bit of this. 
We're going to talk a little about this, their anthropology. You are walking around looking for a God to bow to and worship. You are the God. So get your eyes off, you know. God is a man, and we just cannot make him other than man, lest we make him an inferior one. For man's, an intellig for man's intelligence has no equal in other than man. Allah came to us from the holy city of Mecca, Arabia, in 1930. He uses the name of Wallace D. Fard. That's uh, Elijah Muhammad said all that. Now, what's crazy about this is it's like, okay, true self, true knowledge. But where does it put the epicenter of the religion? Arabia? That's the black man's religion for the lost tribe of Shabazz in Arabia? Do you see? You see it's, it's not, is that helping us know who we are? It, it, it doesn't sound like it to me because you're not, it's almost like white supremacy in a way has done such a number on a lot of people that they don't even want to be associated with Africa. According to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, quote, we are the descendants of the Asian black nation and the tribe of Shabazz. Because of this, many Nation of Islam members adopt the last name Shabazz in honor of the lost found tribe of Shabazz. Shabazz is an Arabic word. Are you sure? My Persian companion, Salman, says Shabazz means royal falcon in Farsi. Besides, the word Shabazz cannot be found in any Arabic lexicon, or so I've heard. Hebrews lights do the same thing. Our true home is Israel. Do you see what I'm saying? And so here, it's, the, it's from Mecca. Salvation. We know we have a Savior. In 1877, a Savior was born. Sounds like a great hymn. <laughs> a Savior is born not to save the Jews. <laughs> not those guys. But to save the poor Negro. You know, it could be both, right? It's just a, it could have, doesn't have to be one or the other. But Savior has come to save you from sin. Do you think they define sin properly or not, if you had to guess, right? Nobody defines sin properly. Everybody undersells it. We should be the biggest believers in sin there is. Everyone wants to minimize what sin is. Orthodox Muslims, you go off the right path. You went, you forgot. You forgot. That's not what sin is. Sin's a lot worse than that. We can't sound like them. My indiscretions, my mistakes, my... We're all, we're all only human. That's, <laughs> you know, everyone underrepresents how bad it is. And you know why that's relevant? Because what happens is if you underestimate, or as W. Bush said, misunderestimate how bad of a problem sin is, then you'll underestimate the solution that's needed. If you see the size of sin for what it is, then you'll understand you need a savior that big as well. But if it's just forgetting, just update your memory, right? If you went off the right path, just get back on the right path. You can do it. Come on. No. Savior has come to save you from sin, not because you are by nature a sinner. Well, it sounds like you haven't read Romans 3, but because you have followed a sinner. Well, if you're in the nation of Islam, that might be true. <laughs> Heaven and hell, I have no alternative than to tell you but there is not any life beyond the grave. There is no justice in the sweet by and by. Immortality is now here. So you believe in paradise and hellfire, yes? I have no alternative than to tell you that there is not any life beyond the grave. There is no justice in the sweet by and by. Immortality is here now. Peace be upon me. It sounds as if you believe heaven and hell are conditions on earth, not places you go to in the afterlife. As Farrakhan once sang, a white man's heaven is a black man's hell. The nation of Islam is starting to sound very un-Islamic. Now, a common criticism of Christian piety for the nation of Islam and other groups as well is that what it does is it's trying to remove your eyes on the current situation and just have you ignoring that. So you're you're pacified in essence. So that's a common criticism. But we, I hope, understand that, yes, that's the ultimate goal, but that means there's gonna be things down here that we affect, that we care about, right? The Christians say, confess the Lord Jesus Christ, or you who are other than the Christians will burn in hell forever. That hell must not be so hot. The one can burn in it forever and never burn up. Ooh, he got us. 
But see how these kind of, it's like almost like a, appears to be a common sense objection. Now, let's just take it for what it is. That is an interesting question, right? Because hell is described as eternal flame, smoke rises forever, and yet it's dark, darkness. So there, so by the way, I'm not one of these guys who doesn't believe in hell. I very much believe in hell. But there is symbolic language to describe what's going on because you have different images used. Like, for example, I don't know for sure if worms are literally eating you, but I know what that represents. That's permanent death, the wasting away, destruction, not annihilation because the smoke rises forever. But you can see how a robust view of hell, understanding hell better, will help you because everybody has a problem with hell. Who the hell likes hell? You guys don't like hell, but we got to talk about it, right? Am I allowed to do that there? No one's here. I'm just kidding. Now you can see why I'm one of the less popular YouTubers. <laughs> the nation of Islam, the future. You knew that picture was coming, didn't you? They're both from Chicago. What do you expect, huh? Shouldn't even be a surprise. You said, where, where is he hiding that picture? I'm sure there's one of those in there. So yes, they've still got sway, but it's not going to last long beyond Farrakhan's legacy. I do not think. I'm somewhat familiar with the people who were kind of next in prominence in the nation of Islam, and they just don't have it. They got a, they got a couple guys who are more like intellectual, like appear scholastic. Some even have PhDs. Then they got other ones who are more charismatic and younger, but probably couldn't lead an organization. But the scholastic guys don't have the charisma. They, they're, they're, they have some problems, which honestly is a good thing. We're not really into cults having long legacies, are we? So in the meantime, there's prominence, and I'm showing different images. I'm not going through all of these, though, uh, where you, you have them having this legacy. And we can't say they never... They only did bad or something like that. The Nation of Islam sort of does have misrepresentation as like uh, permanently violent or just out to kill. That's not really who they are. Even when they did get violent, frankly, it was mainly amongst fellow members. There's very few examples of outward violence. I'm not saying never. I'm just saying they're not really producing this in general. Okay, there's always exceptions. They're not producing sleeper cells in general. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's sort of a different thing overall. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not talking about rhetoric and stuff, but it's important to understand. But nonetheless, they don't have a long, a long shelf life left. And yes, pun intended, they don't have a long shelf life left. At least I don't think so. Because the devil likes to resurrect cults. And if he can't resurrect the cult or bad religion, he'll resurrect the bad ideas in it. The secret. You look at the secret and you look at so, things like that. It's just, it's, it, is, it is definitely recycled. And, and the devil likes to do different ingredient combinations. So it'll look like a new cult and it's really it's just Satan greatest, greatest hits. Or to use an older word, it's a smorgasbord of heresy. So only some people know what a smorgasbord is. Do you know what a smorgasbord is? Yeah. <laughs> so here they got kicked off Facebook and, and uh, Instagram and you got to, uh, Farrakhan did, and you got to ask yourself, are you for that or against that? I tend to be against that because who gets to decide which guys are hateful and get kicked off? If we really believe in the free marketplace of ideas, let them stay on. You know, we're next. So even though people were like, yeah, Farrakhan is off. I was like, I don't know if it's so good that Farrakhan has been kicked off social media. Now, he's got plenty of other people running other different accounts who repost the speeches and stuff like that. So he still has a presence, but, you know, they kind of made symbolic gestures. And it's almost predictable. Whenever there's a hateful act sort of in the media or news, you get, you get these purges. It's kind of, kind of the way it goes. Um, so that happened there. And you also had the situation with, with, uh, with um, Amazon. He's 87. Uh, well, at least when I wrote this, it was. In a while, he's got about 130 mosques, membership around 30K. The high point may have been 250K, uh, the zenith of membership. However, their influence has always far exceeded their membership. This is something very important to understand when you talk about the NOI. 
Dr. Wesley Hammond is one of the guys I mentioned earlier, more scholastic. I read the book God's Black Prophets by one of our scholars. The author clearly demonstrates that the historical, textual, scientific evidences converge to indicate that you are actually a black skinned man whose ancestors were African Semites who crossed into Arabia several millennia ago. Please, sir, it's as if you're marking off scholarship. Is it? Is it that book written by the same man who wrote an encyclopedia that the black man is God? <laughs> yes, but sir, why are you laughing? This is a serious matter. <laughs> it's like Gabriel choking me. <laughs> Except it tickles. <laughs> this is very discouraging. <laughs> Listen, the nation of Islam is the religion for the black man in the wilderness of North America. So the prophet of Islam needs to be Excuse a me. black man. Brother Ben X, younger guy, knows how to use social media. Really couldn't be the leader of an organization, though. So who's a successor? Maybe this guy they got named Ishmael Muhammad, but he just, it's a little bit like watching paint dry. They don't have Farrakhan's gifts. He's rhetorically gifted. So they do have problems in their future, if I was going to predict. Now let's stop there before we... Take on the next group. My companions testify that I am a white man with an elegant face. They describe the whiteness of my complexion and the whiteness of my cheeks and the whiteness of my forearms and the whiteness of my stomach and the whiteness of my shins and the whiteness of my thighs and the whiteness of my legs and even the whiteness of my armpits. Well, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said you were black, and if he said it, I believe it, and that settles it. I am trying to be merciful and beneficent here, just like the great God Allah. I have already told you that the well-known Islamic jurist, Ahmed ibn Abi Suleiman, ruled that if anyone dares to even say that I am black, he should be killed. Well, I still say you're black. Brother Malik, I have already pointed you to nearly 10 sources which clearly describe me and my different body parts as white. Plus, I have already shared with you about the ruling which declares if anyone says I am black, he should be killed. Please, tell me I am white. Just say it. Muhammad, peace be upon me, is a white man. Matter of fact, just tell the truth about me. Muhammad, peace be upon me, is a white man who owned black slaves. Go ahead, it will feel good to speak the truth. Say it, Muhammad, peace be upon me, is a white man who owned black slaves. 